All right, this is it. Episode one of the Happy Musicians podcast, where it's not about getting the gig, it's about enjoying the gig. I'm your host, Tanner Gus, and thank you all so much for being here with me. I'm excited to start this journey, and we're hitting it hard right off the bat with my first guest, Matthew Kilby. Matthew is a high school percussion teacher in Charleston, South Carolina. He's a thoughtful guy, an incredible person, killing player, and he says things in a way that I find absolutely hysterical. I'm just holding in laughs the entire time. We had a lot of great stuff, including his time as a student and a teacher and how those have informed and inspired each other. We talk about anxiety, depression, and the importance of seeing a professional if you need help. And Matt shares his advice on how to be as creative and productive as possible in whatever free time you do have. Thanks so much for being here, and please welcome Matthew Kilby. Matthew Kilby, welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast. Hello. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, really looking forward to it, man. I was hoping we could start by talking about your time as a student, and then we can transition into talking about what you're doing now as a teacher. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So okay. music school, uh, that's a big can of worms. That's tough. And you did your undergrad and then a master's and then also a victory lap. I don't know what you want to call that year. Um, but I just want to hear maybe your opinions on what you really liked about school and what was tough for you and your general perceptions on just the idea of teaching music in a classroom. Yeah, sure. Um, I can totally talk about that. Well, uh, maybe the best part of my schooling um, especially in my master's at IE with you, uh, was walking around and checking out what people were doing that had similar visions, similar goals, but like different experience background than I had and uh, seeing how they reacted to the same environment, you know? So like one, this already kind of relates to being what I've learned about being a teacher. One strategy for teaching successfully is having students constantly model things to each other. And the great part of going to uh, IU was that it was almost a vocational school where we all were learning uh, similar abstractions of the same craft. Like we were learning how Steve Houghton approaches the drum set. And then we can watch each other and how we took in that information differently. And that almost had uh, you know, equally valuable lessons as what we were getting in our private time. Um, so that part of uh, schooling was awesome. Going into the practice room with another student and going over the same topic was always revealing in the, the areas that you each weren't clear on, but the areas that you were actually really getting and that you could help the other person with. Right. And it's it's interesting, like, so much of what happens with higher ed with music is so personal. Like there's not necessarily this absolute benchmark that you're supposed to hit in your lessons. And there probably shouldn't be like, we don't go in saying, Hey, you need to be able to play whatever this rudiment is at this BPM. And that wasn't really the purpose of our lessons. It was more like, Hey, here's this concept. See what you can do with it. Mm. You know, and then do it all share ideas and granted there are schools uh that do do it that way where you know you have a like a barrier system um and i'm not necessarily opposed to that but one of the reasons i i liked uh iu for especially for me because it was graduate school is that it was a time to see how other people responded to similar material valuable lessons yeah well i also agree that learning music is so personal and i feel like the more I grow as a person, even more so than how much I practice, like my concept of music completely changes, especially trying to become a more empathetic person and value mm-hmm. other people's opinions and experiences more. I feel like on the bandstand when I'm playing, I'm trying to do that and value their ideas and musical statements more. And I guess like the longer I'm doing this, the more I'm realizing how deep it goes. And I've often thought like, it is, must be so hard as a university teacher to, your job is like music 
teach it to someone and there's so much to that and that seems very overwhelming it does it seems scary (laughs) (laughs) university level there's so much uh seems like there would be so much responsibility for how you cultivate somebody else's ideas and uh I mean, inevitably your students I would have part of you in them. And I guess that's great because that's what, you know, music is a tradition. It's more uh, maybe related to language and culture than it is to, hey, let's learn to repeat this task, you know. And uh, by teaching someone, you're kind of passing on something about yourself to them that's outside of music, whether you like it or not, (laughs) you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I agree with you. And do you think, Performing. for Dude. sure, do you think studying with Spyro, you got an even more specific experience of learning music as, or learning music and how it relates to culture and religion and an entire experience like that? Um, maybe. Like, that's why I was drawn to him. Um, when I was at IU, because I think that we had, or he, the way that he taught and the way way that he framed his lessons appealed to uh, how I learned in undergrad, because when I I went to school at a liberal arts school at UNC in North Carolina, and becoming a music major, period, was, you know, that happened towards the end of my schooling. The rest of the time, I was writing papers, like, I took film classes and English classes and uh, was just kind of a liberal arts kind of guy, you know? And then he kind of took this anthropological approach to teaching uh, how to just play an instrument that really appealed to me, and I got hooked on it. But I wouldn't necessarily say that that was the moment that music connected culture i think it was just the first time that someone had so explicitly defined it in the way that they taught you know like Mm -hmm. every single lesson he taught was lineage this person taught me this this year in this hotel room and that's how i you know that's why i'm teaching you this it felt direct yeah that's i think one of the the special things that he does as a teacher and it does make it more meaningful maybe and you feel part of the history instead of like an outsider trying to get into it you know definitely so you talked about how the collaboration and the abilities of other students that you were studying with was really helpful for you in learning did you find that the talents of the people that you were going to school with could often be negative in the sense that you were surrounded by these amazing people that were learning the same things. And if you weren't learning at the same level of them, uh, there's a, often a pit of falling into that comparative mindset and getting negative about where you're at in relationship to these other musicians that you're studying with. Yeah. Um, well, when I first came, um, I mean, everybody, especially in graduate school, cause you already did undergrad and you, you are an established human in a different program. Everybody has uh, imposter syndrome, you know, like everyone felt all of my peers when I walked in seemed like they had this aura of like, Oh man, I'm not sure if I'm even good enough to be here. Mm. And uh, some of that fades away when you find your own place. But for me, I kind of accepted, especially the things that I was interested in is that most everyone there was better than me at, several aspects of their playing because they studied something more specific than me or they had some kind of different training. And I was there for like a general percussion survey. You know, I wanted to learn about how to play jazz vibes, how to play the drum set, how to play the congas, how to be a more confident marimba player, like solo marimba player, played a bunch of bata. Um, I would say that I was trying to sample the selection that IU had and have a diverse learning experience Although that some of my teachers maybe would have criticized me as being like not goal oriented <laughs> <laughs> or just kind of scattered, but uh, yeah, I, I I think that I just embraced that 
by nature of what I was interested in that I wasn't really competing with anybody as soon as I showed up and just tried to get as much as I could from the people that were more focused in one area, you know? Absolutely. I love the aspect of learning tons of different things. And I try to do that as much as I could at IU too. And it was always so exciting to find a new thing. And then I would find myself at a certain point feeling the pressure of like, okay, I have a basic understanding and now I want to go somewhere with it. And then feeling overwhelmed of realizing like, this is going to take me so long to get there. And also I'm learning like eight other styles right now. And did, like, uh, how do you approach diversifying your musical experiences and sampling a lot of things and enjoying the variety without feeling the pressure to be a master at all of it? That is a good question. Well, for me, I feel like uh, my entire strategy from uh, the beginning was kind of hey, I need to know a little bit about everything so that I could o be open to one day learning to master that craft should I need it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, when I moved to Charleston, uh, the first thing is that I did not have realistic expectations about what it would be like to be a teacher. And I knew a little bit about teaching uh, just from watching the teachers that I had, but a lot of my viewpoint on that whole profession and way of life was totally changed and I had a chance to hone in on how I wanted to teach and what I wanted to teach and why what I wanted to teach was important because I was kind of forced to come up with my own curriculum. Um, and then the other thing that happened that was kind of crazy is that there was this Latin jazz combo that played every Tuesday uh, here downtown and I got hooked up with them and started playing with them and luckily that was the thing that I was already interested in but since I started that I, I feel like I had a foundation for what the choices I could make were in that environment and then had to learn how to be creative and operate more musically within that schema and luckily those two things were something that I had some kind of foundation for but I think that the key for me was just remaining open to whatever life threw at me. So a more relevant example of me having to immediately adapt was uh, when I moved here, I didn't know how much steel drums I would be teaching. And then when I showed up to my uh, you know, uh, preschool trainings maybe two weeks before, I realized I was teaching steel drums for three hours a day which I was not at all prepared for, you know? <laughs> I had all of this curriculum that I wanted to cover in my percussion classes and was, like, deep into the marching band thing, which it had been a, a minute since I had done that, too. And all of a sudden, I was being thrown into this thing that everyone in our district teaches at a very high level, which was surprising, like, where do steel bands exist? In South Carolina. That's, that's what they... <laughs> <laughs> they exist here, and they're really, really great, like really great uh, programs all around in our district. They're, they're exploding, you know, like high school programs that are playing, like college programs. Um, the thing is, though, is that I had almost zero experience playing steel pan. Like I played a little bit in high school, and like I watched the steel pan concert at IU and may have played congas for them like one time. I don't even remember. So I had to figure out so much stuff, and that class totally kicked my butt. But because I at least knew what they were, or <laughs> you know, I knew the culture, and I had Dr. Joe Galvin as my homie, uh, I could call him and ask him questions, then uh, it, it ended up being an experience that I really learned a lot from. And all of the lessons that I learned just fumbling my way through teaching that class, hope my district does not listen to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all the lessons that I learned fumbling through that made me a much stronger teacher in my other classes because I really had to learn how to break everything down step by step so that I could learn it because I was learning a lot of the concepts and techniques at the same time as my students. I was just trying to stay like a week ahead, you know? 
And have you found that learning with the mindset of having to teach it makes you learn it differently in the first place? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. How so? The, well, you just take so much ownership because you know that you are responsible for giving someone else the only slice of this thing that they may have in their life, you know? So, like, I was much more methodical about how I learned what I wanted to teach than I would have been if I was like, hey, I should learn some stuff about steel drums. And maybe the cynical truth is that never in my life before that was I like, man, I'm going to spend this entire day learning about steel drums just for me. Like, I hadn't done that at all. Um, so that uh, teaching it was kind of the impetus for me to learn something about it. And, uh, yeah, like passing that on felt valuable and I'm glad I took the leap. And now when I'm teaching something, a great way to test what kids know, a form of assessment is to ask the kids, Hey, can you teach this concept to someone else? How would you start? Given what you know, how do you set up the scaffolding for the lesson that I just taught you? And, uh, so I learned a valuable lesson in that. That's so cool. So you have your kids all teaching each other at times now. Or uh, attempting totally, to. Yeah. Totally. And do they um, enjoy that or is it stressful for them? They love it, man. They love uh, they love feeling like they're in charge of something. And I think that, that suddenly it puts the sense of responsibility that I had in the steel drums class on them. And it, everything feels much more urgent, you know? Because if you are the person providing information to others, then you're more skeptical of how of your own delivery or of your own understanding, right? Because you don't want to be judged as someone who learned it wrong. That's, I mean, that's really cool. I, I love the idea that kids are teaching it as they go along. And I feel like that must get a lot more interaction between all the students during rehearsals. Definitely. Definitely. Now, if I'm being honest, like the idea of working with high schoolers is really intimidating. And maybe it's because I don't really in my life right now have contact with anyone that age almost ever. And so I don't really know what kids that age are thinking. Like realistically, I'm not substantially older than them, but I also feel like they've grown up most of their like young adult life, it's been, they've had social media present for its entirety. Like, so that's just the world that they came up in. Whereas I can still remember a time without that. And I'm curious now you teaching these kids, like, do you notice the presence and the results of social media in their lives? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think that it's no coincidence that the generation that has a constant escape from whatever reality they're experiencing also has a lot of trouble with anxiety. So my kids, um, I notice that they are much more apprehensive than the youth that I was around when I was growing up. Or that it's not even that like when I was growing up, if I got freaked out during a test and I cried, then I was just being weird, right. you know, like that's a, like, why is that kid broken? But now <laughs> like, <laughs> all of these kids have these, like this awesome self-awareness about, um, Oh, I'm sorry that I am upset. I'm just anxious. And just give me a second by myself so that I can calm down and work through this. Or, you know, it's funny to walk into a high school and the kid's like, well, my therapist told me that I should do this, which uh, that's cool to me. The, there is a self-awareness that the generation that I'm teaching has about mental health that is so much uh, deeper than the understanding that I was brought up with. But I think that that was an adaptation that formed because of all of the challenges to self-identity that um, social media poses to a young human. You know, you feel like you have to perform 
a version of yourself or you have to uh, have an online presence that is almost like a resume. It's a dressed up version of your own life. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, pressure at a young age, I think, has kind of led into this subculture where we need to talk about our feelings more. So it's like a good and a bad thing, maybe? Yeah, well, so when when a kid makes a claim like that, like, oh, I'm just anxious, I need a minute to calm down, and all the other students in the classroom, do they all get it? Are they like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. Like, they don't really, they aren't even phased by it. They really do, yeah. They're all like, oh, yeah, that happens to me, too. Like, um, Mitchell and Marissa, Mitchell Beck and Marissa Turney, other IU students with me, they came and they helped teach uh, band camp. And during the camp, I asked, just on a break, show of hands, how many people feel like they struggle with anxiety uh, if, you know, it could be musically related or not, just in their everyday lives, right? And, like, every kid in that room raised their hand. That would never happen when I was in school. No way. Every kid... No, I don't even think most kids, like, when I was in school, would have a realistic idea of, like, what anxiety meant. They had, like, a like a TV show meltdown version, you know, like a worst-case scenario. Not that, like, oh, like, me feeling nervous is, right. like, a form of anxiety. Like, that's wild that they have that much self-awareness. And do they... So, you, when you pose the question, they're, they're free to talk about it. Do you notice that they talk about these things freely like do they talk about the effect of social media on their lives and are they like man i feel so much pressure from this and do they have conversations about that or do they seem somewhat unaware that that is maybe a big cause of it are you not really sure i don't think that level of self-awareness is there like i i've not really heard that many conversations are like, oh, I feel this way because I live on Snapchat, or oh, I feel this way because I stayed up until 4 a.m. playing whatever game, you know? It's it's kind of funny, though, because, like, it, just watching all the teachers that teach with me, and we're all from completely different generations, and I get a little bit tired of the progression of, educators being like well this generation can't do this stuff and this stuff (laughs) you know the truth is is that all of the generations were just brought up with different societal values you know so like when someone that was teaching in the 1950s is like oh we were way more disciplined when i was in school and i'm i'm just thinking yeah but like women were treated terribly and like all of your materials were you know inadequate in subjects that we have become more advanced in but also like hey all of the technology that we have leads to all sorts of different problems and maybe instead of having inferiority or superiority complexes about the generations that we teach or different generations of teachers we should all just try to learn from each other um preach it man i love that I I think how I feel generally is that the students that I teach are not necessarily any more ill-equipped than I felt like when I was in school, you know? That's just the thing that I feel like every teacher says. Oh, these kids are ill-equipped. Society is not preparing them for things the way that my generation was prepared. Like, when when my generation was in school... Like, my friends went and smoked cigarettes in the bathroom. Like, no one does that anymore. Not even the punk kids smoke cigarettes in the bathroom. Like, there's just the idea of rebellion and the idea of, like, what it means to be a scholar changes every generation. Absolutely. And got That's really cool. I know when I was going through high school, I didn't feel that much pressure about music. I think... Partially it was because I hadn't, like I had done it my whole life and the, like the very basic just coordination and physicality of drums came kind of naturally to me. So it was pretty easy and I hadn't really 
committed to doing this. And then I felt like when I got to music school and I was like, oh, now, I, I have to be good at this now because this is going to be my career. I felt like my mindset changed in a negative direction and that I felt so much pressure to be really good. And I think it hurt me. I think it scared me into practicing a lot, which was maybe beneficial, but could have gone a healthier route. And I'm curious if high schoolers in general, like the kids that you're working with, do they seem to feel that pressure to perform really well? Or is that not present yet because they haven't uh, set up that expectation that they need to be really good? Does that make sense? Yeah, um, it does. I think that at least I try with my students to have high expectations of them uh, without making them feel like they have to reach uh, some arbitrary benchmark to count as a quote unquote real musician. You know, they don't have to earn their status as I'm allowed to say that I care about music now. Um, I also don't grade very harshly. Like, that's another thing that maybe I shouldn't yell on the internet, but <laughs> I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and bite and say that my grading is on the edge of being almost all like participation. And, uh, is that cool in a conventional sense? Probably not, but I don't think that anyone would ever come into my classroom and say that kids are not trying their best, you know? Because the culture that myself and the other band director at my school has created is such where every kid cares so much about how we play that we're doing more damage control about making sure that everyone feels loved and whole as a person and making sure that they don't over-practice and they, like, go on a date that uh, it's never been, there's never been some driving force like, hey, you need to do this transcription by this date or else I hate you. You know, it's more like, hey, send me a video of yourself playing this thing by this day, and I'm going to give you an evaluation based on these criteria. And I want you to try to fix these three things. And you can resubmit the video as many times as you want. Because I want you to know that you can come for me for information. And when I don't know what to tell you anymore, and I'm going to say that. Like, I don't know how uh, we can improve this. Here's a person you can talk to. Or, hey, let's try something else for a little while, you know? Um, yeah, that sounds like you have a really open relationship with your students in what you expect from them and what they should expect from you. I... I dream of that, you know, it's not, it never feels, I don't think I'll ever get complete satisfaction. Like we have the perfect relationship, but, um, I hope that they feel like they have permission to try their best should they want to, you know, I love that. And so what do you think, what do you think your role as a teacher then is, or as a leader in this scenario, like if if the goal is to help people figure it out themselves and access that information, like what is your role? How do you do that as a teacher? Well, um, I guess part of your question is part of the answer. I help them find their roles and discover things themselves. And I guess like, are you asking like, how do I facilitate that in a classroom setting? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's like a philosophical vision that's kind of nebulous. Okay, how do you actually do that? Um, so uh, my answer, I guess, is that because there's such um, – there's almost like a micro society in high school, you know? Like there's all different kind of kids, and they group themselves in certain ways. And there's this force of what they want to achieve collectively that pushes everyone forward – whether I like it or not, you know? <laughs> so they look towards a kid that they think is great, and maybe I think is just, like, working on the wrong stuff, and no matter what I say, they're going to want to learn what that kid is learned, you know? So I try to facilitate, like, these cultural things, like what's cool for us to learn or 
uh, hey, you should think about doing this audition. This would be great for you. And then I try to give them the tools to do it. Um, maybe part of your question, too, is like, what is the best way to give someone criticism uh, when you're letting them teach themselves or letting them discover their own way so freely? And um, a lot of great educators that I've learned from speak in collective terms when they teach, like, hey, we should try this, or hey, let's turn to this page and try this thing. And something as simple as that creates this dynamic, like, I, as your teacher, am just somebody that wants to give you the tools to meet your own goals, you know? I'm not necessarily going to drag you through a curriculum. You need to have a vision for what you want to do in the world of music, and then I'll tell you what I know about how to get there. And maybe that perspective for me came from uh, teaching at IU for a hot second, like capitalism, man. Like the kids, the grad students are going to show up to my class and be like, hey, you're 25 years old. You're one year older than me. Why are you teaching me anything? So I had to become kind of like a people pleaser. <laughs> what is the thing that you want to know? Like what's something that you've seen somebody else do that you didn't understand? And I'll tell you that. But it also creates this like longing for knowledge collectively. That's really nice. Because maybe that's what we all want as musicians. We're just like trying to figure out what in the world lick did you just play that made me feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know? That's know. so cool. So you're, in essence, you view it as figuring out how to excite students into wanting to learn about something. Like your job is just to create that excitement and that desire to learn. And if you can do that much, then then and if you have the answers ready to go when they come to you like that's how they'll do it themselves if you can create that excitement true that yep it's like more inspiration than uh i don't know pedagogy you know like the greatest teachers in the world tell you why it's a good idea to do something and then when you learn how you're self-motivated it's not like, oh, I have to practice for my piano lesson because my mom sets the timer for 30 minutes. Like, that doesn't really work long term. Yeah. Yeah. Now that you're in that position of being this person, has it given you more personal desire to, to learn more things? And has it kind of fed into itself and that you're inspiring these people and now they're inspiring you to learn more? Yeah, definitely. You definitely like um, there are all these gospel drummers that sign up for my class that are insane and I'll teach them little things about how to read a chart you know just like basic chart reading and then they'll teach me how to do these ridiculous combos that I'll, I still can't do any of them <laughs> but it's awesome because we like create this thing like we're all just trying to be nerds together in this room for an hour and a half so what do you know how to do that I don't know how to do and making that a part of the culture is great because it keeps me curious and learning and it keeps them feeling like, okay, th I'm, I'm more of an ambassador than I am like a authoritarian leader. Yeah. You know? Well, I think I just, I really love that you have created a environment. It seems like, or at least you're doing your best to where no one should be ashamed or afraid of what they don't know. Like you're celebrating what you do know and everything that you don't know is just an opportunity to learn that thing. True that. I yeah. really love that. I would hope that teachers everywhere are aspiring to create that kind of community. And it's tough because you can get overwhelmed and feel like you're a bad musician because you don't know things. And I think if you're shown early on that that's okay and that that's the whole point right like you don't know things and like hey now you get to learn them i that feeds into one of my biggest pet peeves when someone's like oh have you heard this album no and they're like what like you haven't heard this and you get vibed about it you know like yeah there's like a billion albums out there i haven't listened to all of them 
And I, I really try not to do that now. Now I want to be the person who's like, oh, I'm so excited for you because you get to hear this for the first time now. Like the idea of, of holding people or of judging people so hard for not knowing things is just destructive because it's just an opportunity to learn and there's more knowledge than any of us will ever get to. And the sooner we can accept that and use it as a way to grow, the better. Absolutely. Yeah, a 14-year-old teaches me something new about music almost every day. So <laughs> you never know where it's going to come from. That is just awesome. I really like it. Yeah. So even if you can accept that not knowing things is great, how do you approach then setting a goal for the things that you do want to learn or just goals in general, how do you view them? Do you think that it's important or healthy to? And what exactly does a healthy goal look like? Yeah, and I think that's challenging. Um, for my life right now, I don't have as much free time as I used to because I'm teaching so often and I only have a finite time for my planning period, you know, to practice for the gigs I play at night or to write music or whatever I want to do. Um, even, even being creative about a lesson can be hard because there's not that much time to plan. Um, so a lot of my goal setting recently has been more associated with my personal life just so that I can be as free as possible to be creative in my life as a musician. Um, so an example of that could be I'm going to make all my meals for the week or I'm going to try to reach out to my old mentors this week as a source of inspiration. So I feel like when I start my practice sessions, I have some sense of lineage to feed off of. Like whatever I can do to feel free when I do actually sit down and can play tends to do a lot more for me than, hey, I need to learn this thing by this point. Uh, because that's kind of mandated by the gig that you're taking, you know, you take a gig where you have to learn whatever those 15 charts, then you got to learn those 15 charts either way. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's your goal. <laughs> your goal is to eat food and the way that you eat is don't play bad. Uh, and so you, you have a realistic goal for the things that you need to hit. It's I have to make all these goals so that I use my time. I'm free and open in that moment when I sit down. I'm not like eating a sandwich behind the timbales, like trying to like hack something out really quick before I go on stage. I am ready to learn what I need to. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's interesting that your your idea of a goal is is more task oriented and like short term. How do I just be as efficient as possible and do what I'm doing to the highest of my ability. And do you have long-term goals that all of these short-term goals are feeding into, or do you not really think about looking that far into the future? Or maybe you don't value the idea of setting that high of an expectation that you may or may not be able to achieve. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I think everybody has different dreams, you know, and like I have more than one dream. Like I've never been a person that said okay I want to be the thing that I'm going to do forever is be a session drummer or be a composer like these separate things I love doing all those things and I guess my personal dream is to have a life where I can be uh, creatively fulfilled without worrying where my next paycheck or next source of satisfaction is going to come from but as far as, like, am I drumming? Am I doing a podcast? Am I running a recording session? Like, I don't really care. I'm just in it to make cool sounds and to collaborate with people that hopefully know more than me. Uh, but if you do have a dream to do one of those specific things, then I guess, like, maybe you're, if you were using my current mindset your goals could be more towards time met management and less towards uh, I want to master this kind of content because uh, opportunities when you're a musician, you can't really control when they come and go. 
but you can control if you're ready or not. And sometimes the best long-term planning for a great career is great short-term planning. Like, did you have enough time to eat today so that you can like hit the shed for a second is going to do more for your long-term plans than thinking like, okay, I have to have two Grammys by the time I'm 30. Like it's, it's tough to know what kind of opportunities will come, but you got to be ready. Mm. And you can more easily quantify those short-term goals of preparedness and accomplishments so that you can feel a sense of satisfaction and give yourself some momentum, right? Like they're more realistic in that sense too. Yeah, like there's nothing that feels better than starting a week knowing that you are ready for it. And there's nothing that feels worse than like the Sunday anxiety when it comes. Like, oh, we're about to do this again and I'm not ready. So like the best way to make sure that your practice sessions are good is to be prepared for your week. Know what you're going to eat. At least for me, a lot of it is like, meals and just general self-care like what is my mindset this week do i have time to reflect on what i already did or am i just spending the entire week in a car going from gig to gig (laughs) 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 right like yeah so you're kind of you're you're focused on addressing your kind of primal basic needs so that the creative stuff can flow and and happen right because if my career does take off one day, it's going to be because I had the clarity of thought to come up with some idea or some variation of something that someone's already done before me that other people think is cool. And that's only going to happen if I eat my weeds, you know, like if I'm not exhausted and I'm not stressed and harebrained, all that. That's cool. It sounds like the, the Mac he'll be, formula right now is to be prepared and learn as much as you can so that if any opportunity arises you're mentally and physically ready to crush it and but you aren't really thinking about those opportunities you're just thinking about the preparing part of that because that's all you can control right yeah I think maybe right now it is. Um, A year or two ago, it was all about how do I create a creative lifestyle that is sustainable? You know, like how do I pay the bills? Uh, How do I not worry about all these things so I actually can set up my own little studio and be alone in a room with my ideas? And I think that this year I'm feeling this sudden wow, I have a lot of the things that I need and now my goals need to be how can I take care of myself so I can maintain this lifestyle that I worked for, you know? But most of my anxiety and worry, the biggest threat to be me being a happy musician two years ago was like, I don't know how I'm going to have, like, can I have health insurance or like, what am I going to do about my finances? Can I ever buy a house how do i make sure i have steady employment all that stuff is what stressed me out and the the double-sided whatever the what is the term like the sword the double-edged sword is what you're going for the double the the knife some kind of double thing the bad part is (laughs) i i got into teaching for the wrong reason i was like this is going to be a full-time job so that i can shred on the weekends Whoa, I was so wrong. Teaching is so time consuming and is an entirely different vocation. And luckily I loved it, but uh man, like that ruins my life sometimes. Like it's it's stressful to feel responsible for that many tiny humans. But it <laughs> also made my life because by having this teaching job, I'm not really worried about money, which used to be like a terrible force of fear in my life and it's more turned into time management i'm worried that i compromised and i'm lecturing more than i have lecturing most of my time i don't have time to be creative for myself so all my my goal setting is how much free creative time can i give to myself in one day you know 
you got the security that you wanted and now you're just trying to optimize it, right? So that you can also pursue your own personal creative goals. Yeah. Which like it used to be totally the opposite where I was like, I have all the creative time in the world and uh, I don't have any money, (laughs) (laughs) you know? And uh, I think that maybe our, our good friend and mainly teacher, you know, our teacher, Jeremy Allen said it best in his improv class that I took. Sometimes all you need to be creative is a set of limitations. You got to like creativity is like water flowing through a hose. And if you can put something to limit that flow on the hose, like your hand or your thumb, make that whatever magic come out faster. Mm -hmm. That's good. And for me, like I've been more creative now that I have less time because I'm more serious about using my time wisely. Yeah. And you have to be committed to being in the zone when you have that time. Cause you, yeah. like when I was in school and I was like, okay, I'm going to practice for seven hours today. Like I might've been in the practice room for seven hours, but when I made the decision later on, like when I was a senior, we're like, I actually kind of want to have fun this year. So I'm going to limit my practice time, but actually try to crush it when I'm in there and make it count. Like I felt like I would get more done in three hours than I would in seven. Yeah, definitely. No doubt. I totally feel that way too. We've talked about some of the more in-the-moment shorthand mental obstacles that people face, but are some of the more pervasive and life-consuming difficulties that a lot of a lot of artists face, like anxiety and depression? Are those things that you've dealt with and that you, I don't know, have experience with? Yeah, totally, totally. The both sides of the uh, anxiety depression. Uh, dichotomy uh, hit me hard this year for sure because I moved to a new place and like was used to the tight knit environment of being in a studio with all these different people and now I'm just you know I felt like uh, I just moved to South Carolina in the middle of nowhere by myself I'm going to go to this food lion and make myself lunch but <laughs> you know it's, you, there's a sense of isolation that beat me up a lot Yeah, I'm living Uh, that right now. Yeah, yeah. So, like, the depression anxiety thing, I still struggle with, but I've had a lot more success when I make an effort to avoid the things that start my mind spiraling. Like, thing number one. It's not really ever, it's not really self reflection when you're thinking about everything that you did wrong in your life. Like, I used to get into that a lot where I'd be like, dang, like, I did all these things wrong. Like, all my relationships were terrible. Like, I betrayed my closest friends. Was I a good son? Like, all of this. Okay. Like, pump your brakes everyone whole world on evaluating your past in its entirety because sometimes that's not good one productive thing that you can do is get out your journal and write down your thoughts that you're having when you can feel yourself spiraling and then read it later and that makes you feel so much better because you're like what am i even talking about at least for me like i see a therapist and it's good Like, I'm all about it, and uh, that's one strategy that I learned from her that has significantly improved my life. By writing out the thoughts that you're having, you're saying that you are able to realize that they aren't actually based in reality, that they're more of a story that you're telling yourself, and are you able to detach yourself from them, and then focus on more positive things or create a new narrative that's more healthy or after writing it out, what's the next step? Yeah. It's just like you, you just feel this sense of perspective. Like, Oh, this is what I wrote when I was super mad. And you realize that there's all of these sides to one person that you can do peer review on yourself. (laughs) You can listen to yourself from the past and, 
learn from what your tendencies are when you're exposed to certain kinds of things. Like, you know, I've had to come to terms with, okay, what are the things that I do when I'm stressed or depressed? Like, when I get overwhelmed, I shut down and I don't talk, and I go and I lay in my bed and I sleep too much, and I watch crappy Netflix shows, right? Like, I get, <laughs> I, that's my shutdown. So, like, when I feel that happening, I, I know, like, hey, I really got to take care of myself. I got to go for a walk or something or else this thing's going to get bad because I know that this is my tendency, you know? Uh, And you're aware of that because of the self-reflection that you've done? Of the tendency, uh, I mean, or? Yeah, I have like a licensed professional that I take these problems. I I don't think it's fair to say like, everybody, just write down your thoughts and get over it. That's not what I'm saying. I think what I'm saying is that you, if you're feeling bad, then there are people in the world that have training that can help you think, reframe your mind, you know? Like, go see a therapist. Everyone should go see a therapist. It's 2019. We all have goals. We all have fears. We all have dreams. Talk to someone about that without feeling like you're putting some kind of emotional pressure on them to agree with everything you're thinking. You need an, you need a, an anonymous third party that has accreditation to listen to your thoughts and tell you if you're being psychotic or not. Is your (laughs) girlfriend and your mom like can't really do that for you because when they say something you don't like, then you're going to be like to them and that's no good. So highly recommend to the masses if you feel weird, talk to a therapist. Incredible advice. Good. And also, Good. if you if you couldn't tell on the recording, and it was more apparent on the on the FaceTime video, the noise that he made in response of the action that he was doing to his girlfriend or mother was a bite, more animal sound effect. Uh, just thought I'd clear yeah. that up for you guys. Yeah, you can't you can't bite the heads off of your loved ones because they don't understand you when you're really sad. Um, and I've been really sad for it and I, I do that and it's not good, but we're all figuring it out, you know? Yeah. Well, amazing insight. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think that's going to bring us to our code of question section, which means it's time for short answer lightning round questions. Okay. First question being, what's your go-to feel-good album? I'm not sure if this is a feel-good album, but uh, Wilco's Sky Blue Sky has always been my deep reflection slash, like, in my happy zone album, even though it's, like, probably a sad album. Okay. Makes me wistful in a good way. Yeah, connected or human, maybe? Is there a a positive version of the word crestfallen. Like, I'm sad, but I'm aware. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good album. Just listen to that album. Okay. (laughs) Uh, What's the the best advice about happiness you've ever received? Um, There's this quote that I'm trying to pull up right now by Guillermo del Toro about optimism. It's in a Time article. If any of you have your pants computer out listening to this podcast and you might want to pull up safari and go to this interview that guillermo del toro did about uh the power and positive of positivity in modern times it's really good i am gonna read it to you for a charge of nothing wow so here oh, here's here. my gift to you on this podcast someone <laughs> else's words here we go. <laughs> all right Here's Guillermo del Toro. Optimism is radical. It is the hard choice, the brave choice. And it is, it seems to me, most needed now in the face of despair, just as a car is most useful when you have distance to close. Otherwise, it is a large, unmovable object parked in the garage. These days, the safest way for someone to appear intelligent is being skeptical by default. We seem sophisticated when we say we don't believe and disingenuous when we say we do. 
History and fable have both proven that nothing is ever entirely lost. David can take Goliath. A beach in Normandy can turn the tide of war. Bravery can topple the powerful. These facts are often seen as exceptional, but they are not. Every day, we all become the balance of our choices. Choices between love and fear, belief or despair. No hope is ever too small. Optimism is our instinct to inhale while sucking. Our need to declare what needs to be in the face of what is. Optimism is not uncool. It is rebellious and daring and vital. The American writer Theodore Sturgeon once said, this is a quote within a quote right now, 90% of everything <laughs> is crap, and I believe he was right. But surely that also means that 10% of everything is worth the damn effort. And so it goes time after time, choice after choice, that we decide to leave behind a biography or an epitaph. Look around you now and decide between the two. Inhale or die. That's it. Wow. That's a, a fantastic quote. Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll post the link the, to that article in the show notes so that people can check it out on their own too. Because I feel like I need at least three more passes through that to soak it in. Yeah, yeah it's, the, the end of it is powerful to me. It kind of connects to what we were talking about. Like he says, and so it goes time after time, choice after choice, that we decide to leave behind a biography or an epitaph. That to me kind of connects to goal setting. Like goal setting is is can be as simple as deciding like how are you going to be most efficient in your day? Like what are you going to do with your free time? Are you going to make sure that you have the mental space to try something new rather than that that writes your biography and your epitaph more than a, a massive goal to be whatever. Mhm. Mm the drummer that ever was right a goal yeah. of a of a habit more of than a single achievement well i didn't hear that i'm gonna confirm yes <laughs> <laughs> trust me it was good um yeah okay next i guess short answer question uh what's the, who's the happiest musician you know uh the happiest musician um interesting answer i'm gonna pick michael spyro I wouldn't exactly exactly call him my little sunshine, <laughs> but I would say that he has a passion about music and learning that is contagious and obviously affected the way that I teach and think about music. Um, and I think that is happiness. Yeah, he's definitely someone who's fully engaged and empowered and impassioned by what he does. And he gives a lot of value to everyone and seems to enjoy what he does. And I think just because, yeah, he isn't all smiles, that seems like a great definition of happiness to me or an example of happiness. Sure. Yeah. yeah. What one piece of advice would you give to young musicians who are just kind of starting their careers? I think the advice that I would give to a beginning musician is that they should pace themselves with everything in their lives. It can be tempting when you're first starting your musical career to feel like you have to achieve greatness as soon as possible, but you don't really. The, the key to unlocking a happy life and maybe greatness, I don't know, I'm not great, so I can't tell you, uh, is I think just like waking up with an open mind and trying something every day. But the more, the more pebbles you put into your pot none of these expressions i'm using are real the more the more you <laughs> only value yourself when things go well uh the more that you're gonna have like this catastrophic identity crisis when things inevitably don't go your way Absolutely. like when someone tells you that you're terrible for the first time which they will mm -hmm. no matter how they'll pace yourself i love it i like pebbles in your pot is that what it was that was great something about yeah double-edged scissors <laughs> pebble in your pot something. um <laughs> all right and and the last question being what is your purpose as a musician 
My purpose. Wow, that's a scary question. Um, I think my personal mantra for myself is what I kind of said before. I just want to keep waking up every day and being as creative as I can. And whatever comes out of that would, is good. Like, I'm cool with it. Um, but I'm not really sure. I guess my purpose would be to express my humanity to other people in hopes of connecting with them and having a more meaningful life. Because, like, what is life without the connections that we make to other people? You know? Absolutely. And maybe. Maybe I'm getting crazy here, but one criticism that I have of music, the profession, the schooling, how it feels to take a gig, is that it's too in the void, you know? Sometimes I show up to a gig, and, like, I don't know any of the other musicians, and we don't talk. And we all read from our charts, and then we go home. And that sucks. Like, that's not what this is. (laughs) And sometimes... (laughs) Sometimes, like, I have all these teachers that completely transform my attitude towards life, and I do not call them enough, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, what what is the point of being a musician? Like, be, music is all about culture and connection to other people. And when you lose that, it's just like a bunch of nerds playing 251 licks that no one cares about. Like, the intellectual part of music is... Uh, well, yeah, in today's age of automation, the intellectual part a robot can do and will continue to get better at doing. If you ignore the connection and interpersonal part of music, you might not have a place in it in the future, you know? Very true. Very true. Well... That's all the questions I have for you. If you want to take a few seconds now, if there's any projects or things that you are you have coming up that you want to plug and let people know about, you're welcome to do that. Um, man, I have an Instagram. It's uh, at mkilby. Uh, if you want to keep up with me playing the timbales or teaching, uh, there's a picture of my mom wrapped in life. It's pretty good. Uh, I also post a lot of my stuff on Facebook. Uh, I have a single on Spotify under the name M. Kilby. It's called Talk To Me. You are welcome to listen to that. Um, If you're feeling particularly inspired, you could purchase it on Bandcamp. But I'm going to honestly say don't do that and just stream it. Like, just check it out. Don't (laughs) overthink it. Just listen to it. You don't have to buy it. You might hate it. You might love it. Amazing, amazing plug. Uh, All right, that's going to do it for us. Thanks so much, friend. All right. Thanks, Tanner. All right, that does it for the first episode of the Happy Musicians podcast. The song you've been hearing is Talk To Me, the song Matt just mentioned. It's pretty awesome. If you enjoyed the episode and you want to help us spread the message, there are so many things that you can do to help us out. You can subscribe to the show. You can share it with your friends. You can follow us on Instagram at the Happy Musicians and use our hashtag, hashtag Happy Musicians. And you can go to our website, thehappymusicians.com, to get more information and to get in touch with us to share who you think we should have on the show and what I should ask these people. Thanks so much for your time and your attention, and stay happy. <laughs>